Greetings, I'm Trevor Babb with the Contemporary Guitar Blog, and my special guest today is David Tannenbaum, who's joining me from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, David, as many know, teaches at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and if you've ever seen him play a concert live, you know that he is exceptionally eloquent in speaking about music, so this is going to be a very great conversation. We're here to talk about David's new release on New Focus Recordings called As She Sings. David, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Trevor, for having me. Happy to be here. Excellent. So um, I've heard you say, you know, that this recording represents unfinished business for you. You have a lot of these pieces that you had recorded sometimes, some of them many years back. And um, the pandemic kind of gave you this opportunity to get everything together and get this release out. Um, so let's just, you know, talk a little bit about these pieces on the recordings, um, how they came about and um, the stories behind them and uh, how old they are. Some of them, I think, are fairly old pieces. So um, let's kind of just get into, you know, the table of contents a little bit, yeah. and the stories behind them. Well, yes, new old pieces here. Um, well, actually, the recording spans 44 years. So it's almost it's almost a half century of music, and they're all written for me. Um, the first one began my career working with composers. So to give a little context for it, um, I was my parents were both classical musicians, and they report that I was singing Mozart on the swings when I was three. Um, of course, I don't remember that. But I started recorder when I was four and piano with my mom when I was five and cello when I was eight. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I was pretty deep into these instruments. And um, I remember feeling, you know, I just kind of need a break because it's a little tough to be practicing when both your parents are classical musicians and you're playing loud instruments that everybody can hear. So I'm in the living room practicing the piano and they're making dinner and they yell out, David, that's a B flat. You know that. Things like that. <laughs> so I think I wanted some privacy and, and my own musical experience. So I asked everybody involved, including my teacher at the Westchester Conservatory, if I could take a break. I just wanted it like a year off. And at that time, what was in the air was the electric guitar. And of course, I was going to do music. So I found the electric guitar, got into a rock band you know, horrified my dad who had big hopes for me um, in the classical world. And then it just so happens that Andre Segovia was coming to town. And my dad said, well, if you're going to play that stupid instrument, let's listen to classical music being played on it. And that was the moment. I, I remember it so well. It was in a movie theater, very dry acoustics, you know, lots of people, very wide stage and audience. And he came out there and I just could not believe there was just a chair and a footstool and no amplification. And it was the magic of the guitar sound that, that has gotten all of us. And it's the reason we're sitting here having this conversation. And I resolved at that point to never be too far away from that sound again in my musical life. I kind of just knew what I was going to do. But I was concerned about repertoire because I had been playing Mozart and Beethoven on the piano. And you know, I got into Soren Giuliani, got a teacher at the local, in, in New Rochelle, in, in the local town. And so I, I started to have discussions with my dad about that. And two things happened. One is that I got a, a hold of Bream's uh, 20, modern music record with the Britain Nocturnal and the Frank Martin, you know, just a groundbreaking recording that, that um, RCA didn't even want to release and that sold remarkably well. And then I came home from high school one day. I was practicing eight hours a day in those days, and I just ran home every minute I could to practice. And there on my music stand was a piece by my dad. And it was called Music for Guitar. And it was kind of an exploration of the sounds that the guitar could make in about five minutes. And I would say working with composers has never been that easy again, but it just was a revelatory moment. I thought, you know what? I can actually create a repertoire. There, there are so many things that can be done with this instrument. And, you know, Soren Giuliani are great, but look what can be done right now. And it seems to be the instrument of our time. So that was the, the piece that really launched my direction, I would say. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so your first collaborator um, as a composer was your dad. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about, you know, 
your dad's music and how that influenced your musical tastes. Um, obviously, you know, he wrote you this piece and it was very formative in you wanting to be a professional musician. But um, talk about his music, the music that was in his ears as well when you were growing up and the ways that that influenced your tastes and um, getting you to be, you know, someone who's very interested in performing new music. Well, his tastes were very eclectic and my dad lived out loud. So, you know, I was crawling around the living room and he was playing Stock Stockhausen very loud in the living room speakers. Um, he was a big jazz fan as well. He ended up doing a, a Moog synthesizer recording called For the Bird for Charlie Bar Barker. Um, when the synthesizer was invented, he brought the family one summer up to rent the second Moog that was ever made, the first rentable one. He just went up and figured it out. And um, I remember spending a morning with Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington was playing in a town near there. And my dad went up after the concert and said, hey, there's this new thing called the synthesizer. What are you doing tomorrow? I'd like to show it to you. So my dad brought me to his studio and spent the morning with him, watching him see a synthesizer for the first time. So um, my dad was a huge influence and his music was eclectic. It got somewhat more tonal as the years went by, as many composers did, as minimalism took hold. Um, he wrote many guitar pieces over the years. If if I was playing with a viola player, he would write a guitar viola piece, um, sometimes more than I could even keep up with. Um, and, you know, it was complicated because I liked some pieces more than others. Um, but I was, um, I was, I, I keep wanting to use the word aggressive. I was kind of an aggressive editor with him. I, I really got down in the weeds and said, no, this doesn't work, this does, and really bossed him around with the guitar. And he needed that because he didn't really play it at all. Um, and this, there's something very special about this first piece um, because it, it really is an experimentation in what sounds are available. And it goes on it, uh, really a lot of places in just five minutes. Um, so this one, did it need editing? Yes, but not as much as some of the later ones actually. And I would say one of his most important pieces is called Last Letters from Stalingrad. Um, he was, he volunteered for World War II uh, he was just, of course, upset about what was going on over there. He faked his ID and got over there when he was 17. Um, and he lost a leg when he was 20 in the south of uh, France. Um, so he, he lost it above the knee. So he was a vet with a Purple Heart and he was, you know, handicapped. And he, lit, he led an incredibly vigorous life, given that. He went to probably three concerts a week in New York his whole life. He just went to concerts, taught at Manhattan School of Music, nothing, nothing slowed him down. But these letters came out from German soldiers in Stalingrad when the army was surrounded in 1943. What had happened was the German high command asked the soldiers, to, told them that they could write letters home. And they really, they never intended to send the letters home. They intended to see what the morale of the troops were. So they wrote the letters and the high command opened them and read them and stored them and they survived the massacre that happened. And these were published and my dad found them and he set them for baritone singer, guitar, percussion, viola, which is a little bit similar to El Cimarron by, by Henza. He had heard that piece and was greatly influenced by it. I had been touring that piece. And that's a really, really moving piece of his, and we performed it in Germany on the 50th anniversary of the letters being written in 93. Um, so that's, for me, one of his really most important um, guitar pieces, and we've recorded that. Wow. So um, maybe we can get a little bit into um, some of the other music here as well. Um, let's talk about the Ronald Bruce Smith um, piece and just talk a little bit about how this piece came about and you've um you know performed this piece with ron and so we'll talk about electronic chamber music a little later but um how did this piece come about yeah electronic chamber music is a, is good pandemic chamber music you know you can play it without anybody but you're playing with something um i don't actually remember first meeting ron but he was out here doing a doctorate at uc berkeley and uh 
we somehow in the new music world ran into each other. Um, and he had written a number of pieces for soloists with interactive electronics. And he wanted to do that with the guitar. Um, so he came to me and proposed this piece and, and really did a lot of work to put it together. Um, and it was the first piece I had ever done with, uh, with interactive electronics, with, you know, without a pre-recorded um, electronic part. So I played this piece a lot. Um, I think it was 2008 that it was written. And um, you know, Ron got me a Motu, the audio interface, and um, of course I have Max MSP. So I've been able to do it with my laptop and the Motu wherever I'm traveling. But there have been quite a few times when Ron was involved and ran the board as well. Um, but you know, it, it, in any case, even if he's there, I'm changing the. Um, I'm, I'm using a foot switch to interact with the computer. So Ron is not doing that. He did that in the recording, but otherwise when I'm doing it live, I'm self-contained that way. Interesting. So, um, you know, you're not really like interacting with him as you would like another musician necessarily where you're trying to like sync and like, I'm hitting this note, you need to hit the button now kind of stuff. Yeah, he is there as a corrective. Um, and he's there to, you know, work the sound and, you know, the mix and things like that. Um, but no, he, he's not right. I'm not in a, it's not chamber music per se that way. Talk a little bit about the electronic setup with this piece. And, you know, like that's one of the things that people who write electronic music are always thinking about is like, how do I future proof this piece? And how do I keep this piece from, you know, needing constant updates? Um, was it always done with max msp or were you using other things uh, to what degree has the technical setup evolved at all with this piece you know ron is probably a better person to ask the details of that but it has always been at max um but he keeps you know revising it as the program develops um and he keeps sending me new versions of uh of the patches um but it has always been the Motu and it's always been Max. And it's been, what, 13 years now? Yeah. I yeah. think, uh, you know, I heard someone say, a composer said, you know, if I'd known that I'd have to be, you know, revising and debugging patches all the time as these programs change, I would have never gotten into electronic music. Um, yeah. So it it's... certainly is something of a, you know, part-time job to keep up with the ways that this software evolves. Um Another piece that goes way back is um, Dushan Bogdanovich's piece. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, you think you said 20 years ago this one was. Yes, it, it was. It was while he was teaching at San Francisco Conservatory. And it was a, a commission from a, the school with a grant. And it's a, a, po a, a piece that uses really remarkable uh, poetry um, from the Balkans, basically. Um, and it has, uh, you know, flute, um, the singer, myself, and two percussionists who are playing specially made ceramic bowls, actually. So it's a fascinating sound. It's very succinct as Dushan can be. The poetry is remarkable. Um, it's just a fantastic piece. And it's, you know, it's one of these things we recorded it, I think it was 2002 or 2004. And I always wanted to release it, but I couldn't find the right compilation. I couldn't find the right place to put it. And yeah, as the pandemic came, I just started to think, okay, th there are some things that just have to get out there now. And I ran it by Dushan and he loved the recording. You know, it was already edited actually from way back then. Um, so yeah, we were able to release it. That's awesome. Um, talk a little bit about the poetry and, you know, who we're dealing with, who's the poet and, um, what is sort of the content that we're looking at here? Well, it's sort of existential poetry, I would say. Um, so it's by Vasco Popa. Um, in the poem, the, the poem itself is called Games. Um, and maybe I'll read you the first movement, which is called Before Play. It says, you close one eye, you peer into yourself looking in all the corners. Make sure there are no nails, no thieves, no cuckoo's eggs. Then you close your other eye as well. You crouch, then jump. You jump as high, as high, as high, right to the top of yourself. 
Then your own, own weight drags you down. You fall for days as deep, as deep, as deep down to the bottom of your abyss. If you are not smashed to bits, if you're still in one piece and get up in one piece, then you can play. So it's a great setup. I, I find it very musical. Um, and there are seven movements kind of like that. One of them, uh, he dedicated to Terry Graves, who was uh, a guitarist in his trio, the Fire Trio, who died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. And he wrote this very beautiful uh, movement called the Rose Thieves for just guitar and voice in there. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let's, let's get into some of these other pieces here. Um, you know, John Anthony Lennon is someone who, you know, we've we've heard a lot of guitar music out of. Um, he's also someone whose connection with you isn't especially evident because a lot of these people are related to you or your colleagues. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you got to know John Anthony Lennon and how um, this this piece came up, too. Well, this is uh, from a larger piece that he wrote, we called The Fortunals, um, which is three movements, about 14 minutes. And it's just a choice middle movement called As She Sings. Each of the movements in that triptych is kind of a, a memorial uh, for someone he had lost. Um, and we had been, again, I don't remember exactly when, we, when I first met John, but he had written so much great guitar music that we were in touch at some point. Um, I'm pretty sure he came to a concert in Atlanta that I did uh, when he was teaching at Emory. And he comes from the Bay Area and is retired and living here now. Um, in fact, I am thinking about a, another CD and was thinking about including uh, an etude that he dedicated to me. And he said, well, that's cool, but why don't I write you something new? Because it's a 21st century guitar piece uh, recording. So that's going to be pretty fun. So. Um, as She Sings is a very beautiful, very kind of minimal piece. And I don't mean minimalist. It, it really has relatively few notes. It uses a lot of the lower part of the guitar. It's quite slow. It's a beautiful, I think, elegy to end this recording. And his music, I, I really appreciate for the fact that it's, it doesn't sound like any other music. He's created kind of his own sound world on the guitar. Um, I don't know if you know the piece Ghost Fires, but it uses the same instrumentation as the Stravinsky songs. And um, just really special, kind of exotic, beautiful music. So I thought it was really perfect to, um, to end the recording with. We initially wanted to call the recording Shadows and Light because that's the first piece and that's the Sergio Assad piece. But there's a Joni Mitchell album called that and the company didn't want a Google to result in uh, Joni Mitchell instead of this. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Right. Um, is the fact that this is something of an elegy, something that you thought especially appropriate given the year that we've all gone through? I think so, yes. I was thinking about that. And um, I think it was a combination of that. And I wanted something to come down from the Bogdanovich, which is kind of spiky and you know, succinct, 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 excuse me, I can't say that succinctly. Um, you know, it's really kind of shorter movements. It kind of hits you with a lot of information. And I wanted something elegiac and, and sort of drawn out to balance that and end the recording. And let's talk about Sergio's piece too. Sergio's piece is somewhat non-characteristic for him. It definitely has you know, a lot more spikiness in it. It's not nearly as folky as something like Aquarelle is. Um, talk about this piece a little bit in the context of Sergio's work as a whole. And, um, you know, is this a direction that he's been evolving toward? Or do you think this is like a hard left turn for him? It's probably the newest piece on the record too, right? It is indeed. Uh, it's 2016. And I would say the answer to your question is all of the above, in the sense that Sergio said to me that he wants to make every piece now different from anything he had written before. That's his challenge to himself. Um, and he seems to be doing that. He's maybe even like Stephen Connors making portrait guitars, a little bit making portrait pieces for people. 
So this is a piece he had been teaching at the conservatory here for about eight years, and he decided to retire. And also I had a big birthday coming up. So it was a combination of a, a gift, a sort of goodbye gift and a birthday gift to write this piece. And it was, it was really fascinating. He said to me, what do you like to play and what don't you like to play? You like arpeggios? You like scamming? What do you want to do? So he was really thinking about me and my playing. Um, and it's, it, it, you're right. It doesn't sound like anything else he had written. I'm thinking, does he think of me as a kind of more angular, spark, you know, spiky, kind of darker person than I think of myself as? Because <laughs> this is a little darker than Sergio often has done, I would say. Um, it has a really fast, really grooving middle section. Um, and you might recognize Sergio in that, in that he loves to write really fast music. But the slower parts are unusual for him. Um, pretty non-tonal in, in quite, a, quite a bit of it. Um, and what was really interesting was the editing process afterward, where we moved a few sections around, even from the first A to the second A. Um, we kind of played with the structure of the piece to the point where he said, okay, that's it, we've got it. You know? But um, that was a really interesting part of the project. Of course, you know, Sergio's not gonna write anything that you can't play, so you don't have to adjust as you would with my dad's piece, say. But we were working on it structurally. Um, and I think it came out in a really fascinating way. Many people really admire this piece and feel like it's one of his better pieces. Um, and other people don't recognize him in it at all. And I think that's to his credit. And he has continued, he's been so prolific uh, in this pandemic. He's written 24 preludes. I believe he's writing 24 more. He's just constantly a, a, sort of a fountain of music these days. That's amazing. I'm very excited to hear all the stuff he's been working on over this yeah. past year. We're in the middle of a project or, you know, with uh, one of his pieces called The Walls, uh, which he, you may have know of this piece. It's a piece for guitar ensemble and a guitar soloist. It was commissioned by Bill Kanengeiser. And it depicts the different, some of the different, you know, important walls in music, in, in world history, I should say, um, ending with, uh, a movement called No More Walls, which has Mexican music and American music. So you get the point, written during the Trump era. Um, Yo-Yo Ma heard uh, a recording of it or a video of it and decided he wanted a cello version of the guitar part. So they have now gathered quite a few guitarists, and I'm one of them, to record the guitar ensemble parts during the pandemic. I'm paired up with uh, Baji Assad in my part. Um, and so that, that is the, uh, the Western wall. There are four Jewish guitarists. I'm actually not technically Jewish. My mom was not. Um, and then four, let's say, Arab guitarists. So Sergio Odeir, Baji, and, and one other. And so they did that. Like they have the, the Great Wall of China is, is four or five Chinese guitarists and four or five Asian non-Chinese guitarists. So all of these guitarists have recorded the parts. And Yo-Yo is now these days recording uh the cello solo and that will become a youtube so that's just one of the many sergio projects and pandemic projects that's so exciting and yeah. what a cool idea for a piece i remember hearing about that um on your facebook and thought that was just such a cool idea for a piece yeah um, and actually in the berlin wall he's writing 12 tone music at the beginning of it this is sergio wow. <laughs> yeah. jack of all trades i guess yeah um yeah didn't it's, think that's I, great didn't, didn't see that one coming very cool. So yeah. we have Sergio, who's writing very much for you as an individual. And we have your dad, who's writing, it sounds like more for like the instrument as an object. Um, talk a little bit about the other pieces and how they kind of fall within that spectrum of, you know, the individual and the instrument and where each one kind of falls. Well, yeah. And I would say my dad's is... It's personal, but it's, you know, kind of more universal and, and really addressing a question that we were talking about a lot those days. You know, what could this guitar actually do and how could it work in, in new music? Um, Duchamp's piece, you know, was commissioned. It, it was personal, but he, you know, he's another font of music. He's just always creating things. Um, and, you know, what I love about his piece and, and really this CD is just, Oh, the different light that you can show the guitar. I mean, the guitar has a prominent part here 
and it's really the only harmonic instrument, but it it really blends beautifully with the bowls and the flute and the voice. It's just a fantastic setting for the guitar. And as you may notice, you know, I have alternated solo guitar pieces with guitar in other settings. So it goes solo Sergio, Ron's electronic, solo my dad, Dushan Chamber, solo Lennon. Um, the Lennon was personal. It was written for me. Um, you know, he has written an enormous amount of guitar music, but he really was feeling the loss of some people very close to him. And so he felt the need to write this one as well. So it's a, I would say it's a combination. It's, it, I, I would say they're, they're all personal, but they're all playing with the guitar. And I think they, in, in a kind of personal way toward me, they know that I'm an adventurer, that I'm willing to go wherever the composer basically wants to go if I think the quality is there. So, yeah. you know, the, the live electronics was a pretty big learning curve for me. I mean, I just, I worked on the guitar part with the foot switch for a long time before I got the electronics involved. I just needed to get used to having a pedal and, and timing the pedal. And then I started to hear the electronics. Very cool. Talk, yeah. you, you know, the, the, the electronics, that, that's another thing aside. It's kind of like a third point off the spectrum from this. Um, what do, how, how does the guitar change? when you've got these electronics that are interacting with the instrument and how does that um you know turn this guitar into something bigger than itself well it technically extends the guitar um in terms of uh sustain it can do that a lot um it's echoing so it's sort of enhancing that way um it sometimes is surrounding the guitar with lots of sound. So it makes it vertically bigger. Um, and then, you know, the way it's interacting, I mean, I will instigate the electronics, which then do layers and layers of loops on top of what I'm doing. So there are a lot of extra dimensions created um, by it. And the last movement is this kind of wonderful setup where there are different effects that are instigated along the way to the point that you have everything going at once. So each, each movement takes a very different course. Um, but in the last movement, you have you know, bells and drum sounds, the guitar doing some scales, echoes of that, all kinds of layers, a very big vertical texture then that gradually narrows and narrows until the end. Whereas there are other movements like the third where I'm doing pretty fast licks in the left hand, and it's basically just enhanced. It's just kind of a little bit of an echo until it gets excited later in the movement. So in the two slower movements, the second and fourth, he's using more and more echo and sustain to enhance. In the faster movements, he's sort of echo, he's um, looping some of the fast stuff. So there's just different effects in each movement. Um, and I, I think that's what keeps the piece interesting. It keeps it varied. Um, the use of electronics is particularly exciting in that piece, I think. Yeah, I think it is too. I think sometimes we get into this rut with electronic music sometimes where it's just like, you know, here we are, we got like all these like weird sounds, right? And sometimes the cohesion isn't there, but here there's like the electronics are so interactive and they're so, um, everything's kind of being triggered by the guitar and you're you like we've said it's electronic chamber music you're making music with yourself with technology and yeah. um so that's really really um great you know i think the proportions are right in that piece like it doesn't wear its welcome out each movement lasts maybe you know three minutes and you get these wonderful effects and this wonderful interaction and then we move on so it doesn't overstay its welcome and i think that's a real positive in that piece so um, let's talk about what's coming up next for David Tannenbaum. There are a few projects in the pipeline that you haven't talked about yet. There are others that are that we have talked about. What else is um, going to be um, some stuff that we can look forward to from you? Well, I'm. I was actually working this morning, even though we're we're very early now, California time. But I've already been working on a cover for a Naxos. Um, uh, concerto CD that's coming out in July. And I'm really, really excited about this. It's mostly new concertos, uh, a disc of pieces written for me, except for the piece, it's a double concerto, which is 
a wonderful piece that is of the four that he wrote with the guitar, certainly the least known. Um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of recordings, but it's, for those of you who don't know it, it's a concerto for guitar, bend on your own, his own instrument and strings. Um, and so that's on there as is a new, kind of new concerto by Aaron J. Kernis, um, something he wrote on commission for Minnesota Orchestra in 1998. Um, and what that is, there's a pretty well-known piece of his that he dedicated to me in 1993 called 100 Greatest Dance Hits for Guitar and String Quartet. That, you know, in 25 or so years of life has had four recordings and countless performances. I think I've played it maybe up to 50 times by now. It just gets played a lot. Um, and so when Aaron got this commission, he decided to write for strings only to orchestrate two of the movements from 100 for string orchestra, and then to take a movement from uh, a solo partita he wrote for me earlier um, and orchestrate that as well. And that became this, what's called Concerto de Dance Sets. Um, when, you know, we've worked together for a really long time and, and have edited his guitar music for a long time. When he submitted this to me, I thought it was great, but I said, you know, it's sort of like Segovia talking to Villa Lobos, it's not really a concerto without a cadenza. I need a cadenza. And he said, well, you know, I'm super behind on commissions. I don't have to, time to write one. Why don't you write one? Now, I've never written anything. I don't do well with the blank page. But in this case, I had material, of course, from the piece. And I had a great composer there to hold my hand. So right near the end of the piece is a cadenza that I, that I wrote. And it's the only thing I've ever written. Um, but that was fun. Um, so there are two other Kernis first recordings on this uh, upcoming disc. One is a soliloquy, a piece called Soliloquy that he wrote for me in 2016, a present for that same birthday that uh, Sergio wrote for. Um, and this was just beautiful. I was, uh, friends of mine had organized uh, a big kind of party concert and Aaron wrote this piece spontaneously and flew out to the West Coast to hand deliver it to me. So it was just amazing. I'm sitting there at the, the party before the party, the night before, and there's Aaron on the street of San Francisco with a piece in his hand. So that was an amazing moment. Um, and then also on the disc is a first recording of a piece called Lullaby by him. Um, that is a piano solo, uh, sort of an evergreen one. It's just very beautiful. It just doesn't age at all. Um, and he made a flute guitar version for Ben uh, Verdery and his wife, Rie Schmidt. And this is a violin version that he made. Um, and this is the first recording of that. So there are three Kernis pieces on it. And then uh, there's a, also a new concerto by Roberto Sierra. Again, new, well, it was written in 1998, but I have not recorded it before. Um, this is called Pequeño Concierto. And it's Pequeño in two ways. One is that the orchestration is small. It's just violin, cello, flute, oboe, clarinet. And also the dimensions are small. It's about maybe 11 minutes. No movement is more than three minutes, but it's a, just a beautiful, evocative, kind of vigorous, uh, small concerto. And then there are, there's a bonus track of uh, a Dushan Bogdanovich piece called Village Music. He wrote that for the Lou Harrison National Steel just intoned guitar that Lou dedicated his last finished piece to me for that instrument, essentially invented a new instrument at the age of 84. And um, Dushan, was living here and teaching here and heard that instrument. And it was one of many composers who said, I've got to write for that thing. So he wrote a solo piece for that. So cool. Um, always um, a pleasure to talk with you, David. And um, looking forward to hearing more great music coming out of you um, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs>